Well, I'm Chris Busby, and I'm well known, reasonably well known for my my anti what you might call anti nuclear science, which is quite successful at the moment. But there's something else that, that people don't know, and that is that I was the first coordinator of the Green Committee of 100, which was at the forefront of the direct action movement, which occurred in in the 90s. Uh, and I put forward together with David Taylor uh, at conference in Hastings, I think 1994 it was. But, um, the idea that, and it went into into the manifesto for a sustainable society, or or it should have done policy, that that any sort of methodology for taking control of society or making the world a better place was to be permitted, so long as it involved non non violence. You know, so you didn't try, you didn't hurt anybody. So you, so I saw, I was right at the front end of that non violent direct action movement as the first coordinator of the Green Committee 100. A lot of people joined. So a lot a lot of people and um, I, we had a, a card index of about 300 people. The idea was that they would come to whatever demonstrations or lying down in front of diggers or whatever it happened to be. And I, and I was there at Salisbury Hill too on the BBC talking about this when when everybody was lying down in front of the diggers. There. And a few, quite a few people did lie down in front of diggers and a lot of people got hurt. Um, anyway, we all had funny names. So I was Wasp, there was a guy called Black Dog and then my daughter Celia was called Carly. And uh, a, lot, a lot of those people um, who you, you identify now, I suppose, with that movement, were all in the Green Committee of 100. The problem is we didn't have a lot of money, and so we used to meet down in Brixton, and people had to come long distances. And, of course, the kind of people that there were who did this were all very poor, so it was quite hard to sort all this stuff out. Anyway, we did a number of actions. The first action was uh, Dungeness, which we could, we'd done one in Trausvenes nuclear power station in Wales. That was before this was set up, and we'd, we'd sort of chained ourselves to the gate, and, and nobody could get in or out. And eventually they closed Trasfinet, I think partly because of that. So we did Dungeness, which was down in Kent, um, and the police came and so on. But we were chained, we were chained up, so nobody could go in and out and all the rest of it. Uh, in fact, I gave I gave a lecture um, to the South Place Ethical Society, which is quite a posh outfit in London. They're, they're based in Golden Square, and previous lecturers had include all sorts of important, you know, people like Bakunin and, and George Bernard Shaw and so on. So there I was on the menu there talking. And you can find this on the internet where I gave this lecture. They published the lecture about the the ethics of nonviolent direct action, and basically what I said is that if the captain of the ship is uh, is a nutcase and they're not telling the, the the crew the right you know what's what's correct about what's going on you're entitled to take control of the ship and this is certainly true of democracy since democracy depends upon perfect knowledge so if you tell the people in your democracy a load of lies and they vote for you then then and afterwards it looks like something bad is going to happen you're entitled to well, I mean, really, you're entitled to wrest control of the society, you see, and so that was the argument from from the people who are running it, who are obviously dishonest and and wrong. Anyway, so that was the basis of nonviolent direct action, and we we did Dungeness, and the other thing we did was uh, we broke into the flats opposite New Scotland Yard in order to that were owned by some very rich people who just you know kept kept they just bought them for for making money so we smashed our way into that and we put a load of people who, who were homeless in there that didn't work out too well because most of the homeless people were drug addicts and nutcases and so on so they were all beating each other up and it wasn't very you know our idea of, of a sort of perfect society in New Scotland Yard didn't work um, and then the other, uh, another one that we wanted to do was, was we wanted to do St. George's Hill, um, you know, the diggers. So, so around about 1995, this was all organized, but I left the organization to George Monbiot, who had sort of come in and joined us. I'm not sure if he was even a member of the Green Party at that time, but he used to turn up at the Green Party conferences and bore on about how the land is ours and all the rest of it. And so I kind of left that to him. But afterwards, I was told that, that, that instead of going to St. George's Hill, and, I, and all of my activists came down, all the black dogs and red cats, and we had one guy, Captain America, and so on. They all turned up there to go and put up teepees at St. George's Hill and dig it and so forth. And then Monbiot turned up and took them off somewhere else, you know, and stood up and made a load of arm-waving kind of bullshit sort of arguments about how great he was. 
and then it all yeah, it up. Was the airfield which is kind of nearby and i think it was on the saturday of the occupation back in 1995 i think it was uh, around about easter time uh, maybe the summer um there was a procession up to st george's hill and a performance of um st george and the dragon the dongas tribe were there That's uh, right, yeah. was, uh, but it wasn't actually on st george's hill but it was covered by newsnight i remember shane collins in the bath on newsnight from wisley airfield yes well i mean but the people i talked to about it were pissed off you know they said that they they had assumed that they were going to have to stand there and you know the, and the cavalry would ride them down just like it happened but with you know, in 1649, St George's Hill, the ragged At band, least they the St George's stuff. Hill, Chris, and to what? be frank, I mean, there was the new Criminal Justice Act at the time, and the organisers were concerned that they would have their property seized by the police uh, and by through the courts uh, if they if they were to do something like that. So that's why they went to Wisley Airfield, which was a more neutral venue. A lot of powerful people live up on St George's Hill. Well, okay. Well, then, and, you know, but then you, you're not, you're not, you have to be brave, you know, if you're going to do this sort of shit. I mean, when I chained myself to the nuclear power station with all my mates in, uh, in Trust Minutes, they said we were going to get shot. The people there who were the, the, the men at MOD police who, who were part of the nuclear police force there, they all had pistols. And, you know, we thought there were lots of people that didn't come because they were frightened. They thought we're going to get shot. There's going to, you know, we're going to be dead or we're going to be arrested or this and that. You know, you've got to be brave if you're going to do this. I mean, I've been threatened with all sorts of things about losing my house here and losing my property there and all the rest. And I, did, I have had a few bits of property that I could have lost. And I thought, well, no, I mean, you know, either I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do this. And lots of people in, in my game have been killed. OK, like my 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 American attorney, Stuart Smith, who died, you know, he, he they I, I believe they killed him. OK, anyway, so and this happens. And certainly there are people that they have tried to kill. Rosalie Bertel told me that they tried to kill her and all sorts of ways in which they did this and so forth. So, you know, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to be brave. And if you're and anyway, I, to, to, to be honest, I don't think that that Monbiot is it, it, it was anything but a, but some sort of stooge at that point. You know, Mon Monbiot is out for himself. George? Did you ever confront George about this face to face? No, he won't talk to me. I, I, I tried to confront him about the way in which he he he, he uh, you know attacked me through the columns in the Guardian, and he he wouldn't ever meet me. We, uh, the 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 CND in Oxford asked him to come along, and they said, "Look, you know, you two should should have a debate about all of this stuff at Oxford Town Hall." And they did, and and there was me. I was there, and he didn't turn up. He refused to turn up. And then Bramhall tried to get him to to talk about it at various conferences, and he just blanked it each time. He won't talk to me. He won't debate to me. Okay, so what happened to the Green Committee then? Well, it it uh, it. it it just more or less fizzled out, really, because I, I sort of lost inter interest in it after all of that stuff. And, and, and basically, I said to everybody, look, you, if you're going to do direct actions, you just have to do, to do it yourself. I mean, the last direct action we were going to do, which I organized, was up at Sellafield. We, it, was, um, it was really quite a clever one, in fact. We were, we, were going to, we were going to go to either side of the Sellafield site, and we were going to put some radioactive material i mean you can get radioactive material is these gas light lanterns tilly lantern the little white things you know that glow in the when you when you have a, a pressure lantern and they're, they're they're quite radioactive so all you have to do is put one on a stick and point it up to to one of the detectors on the on the perimeter fence you see of course that will go berserk um as if there had been some alarm and then we were going to sort of time it so we could go from one of these things to the next one so that it looked like a cloud of radioactivity was going across Sellafield. and so we were going to, then going to see how, how long it took before they sort of jumped up and started running around checking things out you know to show how useless they were anyway we were not allowed to do that the green party um supremos said you know this isn't on and this is not right and you know people will get no, no at the yeah. time we're talking about around about 1995 here chris there was yeah, a debate yeah. about whether the direct action and in, in a way the 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 whole diggers thing was part of this whether the direct action should be against things we don't want or for things we do want 
I never heard anything about four things we do want. I mean, that, that absolutely didn't happen in, 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 in the Green Committee of 100. It was about blocking roads like Salisbury Hill. That was one of the, a lot of our people were there. And I was there also on, on the BBC when, when all those people were there kind of stopped. I mean, stopping. something similar is happening now, isn't it, with this Extinction Rebellion, don't you think? Yes, yes. No, I mean, I've talked to those people. I, I mean, I, I, I've got a lot of time for those Extinction Rebellion people. Good for them, you know. Good for them. But anyway, I can only tell you about, about the fact that I was in at the beginning. And Oliver Tekel, too, he was in at the beginning, too. He invented the basically invented Earth First. So he, he started something called Earth Warriors, you know, which had a kind of like instead of a, uh, uh, in, in, instead of a hammer and sickle, they had a, a hammer and, a, and, a, and a, a, a monkey wrench or something like that. And he printed a load of T-shirts and so forth. Um, I've got a lot of time for Oliver. He thinks the same way as I do. And also he's a physicist as well. Anyway, the point about all of this is that the Green Party itself more or less got rid of the, the Green Committee of 100 because the Green Party was infiltrated. I mean, I, 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 all the time I was in the Green Party and really active up to about 2000, I suppose, we, we actually did things. We really discussed real things and we had real arguments about things and we came to sort of real conclusions in some, in some kind of Hegelian discourse. But after that, it sort of, after we lost control to the executive, which, which happened as a result of a kind of palace revolution, um, what involving that woman, what she called Sarah Parkin, another dodgy character, uh, and, and Jonathan Porritt, both of whom, I, actually I got Jonathan Porritt kicked out of the Green Party and Sarah Parkin disappeared as well because I had a bad had a go at her too. Anyway, her husband is the head of the International Association Against Cancer in France, you know, DM Parkin. So that where, why she ended up in the Green Party just after Chernobyl is anybody's guess, but I have my own ideas. Mm -hmm. But then Petra Kelly, who I also knew, and who who was going to come to England for our trust minutes things? Then she was assassinated, and uh, and you know they also they say well, they say well she she was killed by her her boyfriend who was good Bastian. He was a, a ex Stasi guy, but it's obvious obvious rubbish. You know she was obviously assassinated, and I know why. Um, I absolutely know why too. Petra Kelly was more or less the head of the German Greens, okay, and she was she was absolutely anti-nuclear and the, and the German Greens at that time were like an anti-nuclear party is what they were um, and so she uh, I think there was a reason for it that I think her sister died of leukemia or something like that but anyway um, she I, my friend Bill Pritchard who I stood in the election in 1994 in Wales on the, on the basis that the Trous Venice nuclear power station was dangerous and it had all sorts of cracks in the pressure vessel and this and that and they were trying to get it to, to, to continue to operate and we had seen what happened in Chernobyl so we wanted to stop it and that was why we chained ourselves up and so forth but we had but he asked Petra Kelly to come and talk uh, you know to support him in that election um, and she said yes she was going to come from Germany but then then what happened is um, that she was assassinated um, and uh, and later in 1998 I met Ernest Sternglass in Munster and I went there for a conference uh, for the German Radiological Protection Society. And he told me that he met her, uh, Petra Kelly, and she was really excited about all sorts of information that she got from some guy, a Russian scientist, who was going to bl blow the whistle on what was happening after Chernobyl, all the people who were dying, all the cancers, all the leukemias, this and that. And she had uh, negotiated a, a, a series of programs with German TV, to talk about the health effects of the Chernobyl accident. So we're talking 1994 now, 93, 93. Um, anyway, just before she died. And so she, because everybody said, oh, she was really depressed. I mean, this was the story that came out from Sarah Parkin. Sarah Parkin wrote a book about this, you know, the, the, the life and death of Petra Kelly or something so like that. Almost, uh, misrepresenting it. Yes, yes, that's right. Sarah Parkin said in her book how depressed Petra Kelly was, and that's why she killed herself, you see. But, I mean, that was just a lie, because Ernest said that he talked to her and that she and this guy had this had this series that was coming out on German television in which they're going to say how everybody was dying as a result of the, of, of the radiation from Chernobyl. Um, so then she dies, you see. And then afterwards, Sarah Parkin writes this book. 
she was certainly doing doing something in Dublin with this book about Petra Kelly. And my mate Scottish Dave went to talk to her about it. And he said, well, you know, Chris Busby says everybody is dying after Chernobyl. And she said, oh, well, you know, Chris Busby, well, in that case, you know, I mean, my, my husband has done all the work on Chernobyl that shows there's no problem and so forth. So you have to ask the question why her husband, D.M. Parkin, was appointed to be the head of the people who investigate cancer in Lyon, in France. Okay? And every single thing that comes out of that out of that operation in Lyon shows how we don't really understand what causes cancer. Certainly radiation doesn't cause cancer. And they're always writing lots and lots of papers uh, in which they, they they give the definitive account of how radiation can't possibly cause cancer and all the rest of it. So that that is a major operation run by D.M. Parkin, who is the husband of Sarah Parkin. And before before that, he wasn't anything very special. He was just some kind of lecturer at the University of Birmingham. So you have to ask, how the hell did he get to be the head of such an important organization, you know, administering, administering enormous amounts of money to researchers to prove that Chernobyl didn't cause any effects? So there's a big, big story. The big story there, I mean, you know, boil it down, is that there are lots of people who can change the world. And what happens is they get them. They kill them or they, they push them out some sideways or they dismiss them or they lose their money or they lose their house or it does whatever it is. If something happened to the Green Party, as they started to get um, local council seats, uh, uh, it turned from, I always remember going to, I think it was in Salisbury, a Green Party conference where they had a uh, anti-New World Order um, fringe meeting, where they, which was very, very well attended. Uh, and this all this stuff got kind of pushed out in the late 1990s, Chris. So, so what That's is the right. Green Party? now the green party now is is is, a, is an operation it's 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 a, a a number of people who've been who've been got at or threatened or or else in some way are the wrong people all the all the right people disappeared all the people i knew who really were interested in all this stuff and could actually do things they thought would well, blow this i'm you know i'm not going to continue to to go and in, in, get involved in all of this stuff the green party is now focusing on on local elections that's what it does so what you have is you you take mm -hmm. over you know bog hole council and, and everyone says oh how wonderful well, it they're is they're doing quite yeah. well here in bristol but look at the end of the day they're trying to get rid of cars i mean there's a replacement by electric cars which are incredibly heavy also of course lots of mining involved in getting the batteries together now i can remember i'm sure you can too the 1980s where we had a different system which was public transport which was very cheap of and effective. course, of course. We, don't, fact, we don't need cars ken, ken we don't livingston, need cars ken livingston uh did very got very close to actually making all london uh public transport free and the result of that was that there were uh i think it was 1986 maybe 1985 something like 1500 less serious accidents on london's roads and people were, were were voluntarily getting rid of their cars yeah but anyway back to george mombia george mombia in my opinion is is an operator he, he he for whatever reason you know money or power or influence or whatever it is you know he he is somebody who will twist twist reality in order to to help the people who support him or enable him to remain in his position and there are a lot of those people in the anti, in the anti-nuclear science if you like to call anti-nuclear science as well. I mean, it's, it's and, and, the, and the pesticides too. You need to talk to George, Georgina Downs about what they did to her, you know, all the pesticide spraying, you know. So she, she is another mate of mine. So she's somebody who can change things. But as soon as you get to so you can change things, they get you. Yes, tell us a bit about her. George. Well, George is a very clever and very powerful woman who I, I got to know quite well. Um, I don't know when this would have been, you know, during, during, so in the 90s anyway. And she took them on on the basis of stopping, uh, the, her, her thing was that the farmers are spraying all these pesticides around the fields and the stuff is drifting over populations and these people are getting sick. And so she, she managed to eventually, with her own money and money that she got from her dad, take a judicial review against this practice and she won it extraordinary all on her own you know she stomped about in there looking beautiful and she persuaded the judges that this was wrong and they and they and they said okay it's wrong we have to stop it but actually nobody stopped it and then what happened is then she wanted to sort of make sure that it got stopped and and a, and a new outfit called 
I can't remember what they call the pesticide something society or something. It suddenly appeared out of nowhere. And uh, and then they managed to take the get they, and they sort of basically squeezed their out sideways. They got all the money that anyone was giving towards this this operation, and they they made out that she was a nutcase. The problem the problem was that she you know she's like me. She's sort of like quite larger than life character, and so it's quite easy to show that she's a nutcase. In fact, that's what they've done with me. That that so although I'm you know I, I'm. I, I know a lot of stuff and I win the arguments in terms of rational thought and, and science and epidemiology. If you look on the internet, you'll find I'm a nutcase. You know, there are lots of people making out I'm a nutcase, including George Monbiot. Not only a nutcase in the case of George Monbiot, but also a crook, someone who sells pills to the Japanese women and, and runs off with a load of money and, you know, all sorts of in, innuendo and, and, uh, and, and sort of dishonest sort of spin. Do you think in 50 years' time there will be a massive nuclear program still? No, I think we'll win this. I mean, we've won, we've won the... We've, we've won... Well, the, there are two, two answers to that. The point is there shouldn't be, is the first one, because people are all dying as a result of the exposure to all this nuclear stuff. Yeah, and, now, and now they're sort of they now short of shooting depleted uranium around the place too, and people would die as a result of that. But, but the other answer is that maybe... Because the fact is that we do need, you know, to run some sort of system, we need, we need or they need energy in order to run their, their system, they need energy. And in cold countries, they do need energy. I mean, they cut all the trees down now. And so if you live in Finland or Sweden or somewhere like that, no, not Sweden, they've got hydroelectric. But theoretically, in places that are cold, Latvia and all that, you know, how, how are you going to deal with not freezing to death? So on some level, you have to have some kind of balance uh, between the amount of deaths you're prepared to have and the amount of damage to the genetic integrity of the human race and all the creatures and all the rest of it, there will have to be some discussion on, along, that, along those lines. And, I mean, m my position on that is, that is that I guess in some way it has to be a democratic discussion and people have to have perfect truth and they have to make a decision about it. So on that level, I'm not anti-nuclear, but I, I'm anti-nuclear on the level that, 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 that they lie about all of this stuff. They say there, is no, there are no downstream effects and everything is fine and, you know, nobody's dying of cancer from, from the radiation. I mean, they, they don't explain where, why they are dying of cancer, but they just wave their arms about. And people, people like Parkins, Sarah Parkins' husband, are right at the forefront of that. And they just lie and cheat and they write papers that are nonsense and, and so on. And then the politicians rely upon those papers in order to scam the public into believing that nuclear is OK. And idiots like Monbiot, or maybe not idiots, but certainly a lot of idiots who, who, who align themselves to Monbiot, don't, don't know enough science to know that that's a load of rubbish and that all, what they're doing is they're just funding people to make more and more money out of uranium. And that's going to result in a lot of death. OK, well, anyway, Chris Busby, thanks very much for joining us. OK, that's all right.